Hello and welcome to India's World. Pakistan has just undergone a historic election. Historic because this is the first time that the transfer of power has taken place from a civilian government to another civilian government through the ballot box. These elections were both for the National Assembly and for the assemblies in the four provinces. At the national level, Nawaz Sharif's PMLN, Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, has won a majority. They have also won the majority in Punjab. In Sindh, the Pakistan People's Party of Zardari has got the majority, but they've been wiped out at the national level. In Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, which was earlier known as the Northwest Frontier Province, is Imran Khan's Pakistan Tehreek-e Insaf Party, which has won the large, largest number of seats. In Balochistan, there's a complete mess up. In a 65-member uh, assembly, the largest party is only 10 seats. Others are 9, 8, and so on and so forth. What do these elections mean for Pakistan? And what kind of challenges do they pose to the new government in Pakistan? To discuss this issue, I have with me three eminent experts. I have uh, uh, Ambassador Lalit Mansingh, a former foreign secretary and a great votary of peace and friendship with Pakistan. You're part of a prominent track two dialogue with Pakistan, sir. My old friend Javed Nakwi, one of our most prominent journalists and the correspondent of uh, Daily Dawn uh, from Pakistan in India. And uh, Tapan Bose, chairman of Pakistan India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy. He's spent a lifetime trying to improve the perceptions of <laughs> Indians and Pakistanis about each other. I don't know how successful you've been, Tapan, but it's a job <laughs> worth doing. Uh, let me begin with you, uh, Ambassador Mansi. You see, about these elections, one hears two kinds of uh, perspectives and two kinds of views. There's one view that a great uh, event has taken place, that this will shift the balance in favor of uh, civilian power in Pakistan and it will sow the seeds of democracy in Pakistan. And then there are the hardliners, the so-called Dandamar Brigade, as I call them in India, who say that, look, don't read too much into this election. Pakistan will never change, and the army will always have a veto over all crucial issues. So how do you, how do you analyze these two perspectives? But as always, reality is always in the middle. Mm -hmm. So you should neither treat it with euphoria, nor, nor with cynicism. For Pakistan, it's a big step forward. To have the first real elections in 66 years is a big event for Pakistan. I think we should welcome it for what it's worth. What is good about it is that it promises stability, political stability in Pakistan. It marks perhaps a pause in a declining Pakistan, and maybe there'll be some kind of revival. And I think in the, if you look at the larger picture, some hopes for peace in the region. So I think we should largely welcome it and not uh, be cynical about it. Javed, one of the uh, remarkable things about this election is that three parties, uh, uh, their presence has been um, uh, diminished. Uh, the Pakistan People's Party, the Awami uh, National Party, and uh, PMLQ, Pakistan Muslim Le uh, League Qaeda Azam. Uh, now, PMLQ, nobody is going to mourn its demise because it was essentially an instrument created to legitimize Musharraf's rule. Yeah. But PPP and ANP were liberal and secular parties in Pakistan's context. So they're going away, or they're, their importance uh, being reduced uh, in the public sphere. What does it mean for Pakistan? See, I, first of all, when you say it's a historical election, it is. And, and as Ambassador Dalit Man Singh said, it's a, it's a very remarkable event uh, for Pakistan that these elections were held and uh, power was handed uh, by a civilian elected government to another elected government, which is very, very rare in, in Pakistan. Now, the question about stability, uh, I think there may be icy kernels of instability here in this election. No, we'll come to instability. But, but, tell but me I'll, about the PPP. The, 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 reason is, the reason is that a party like PPP, at least it had a pan-Pakistan influence. It, that was the only party, perhaps, which had a pan-Pakistan influence from Balochistan, even frontier, Punjab, southern Punjab at least. Now you have, uh, ANP has been marginalized, as you say, call them secular parties. I don't call them, any of them a secular in the, in the strict sense because all of them were anti ahmadiyas They all, uh, they, they, they joined hands in marginalizing and excommunication of Ahmadiyyas, including the great secular Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto. So I don't know at what liberal. level are they secular. So everybody is complicit in this. But uh, for current purposes, and let's be generous, 
Um, that PPP, yes, it has, it is going to see a very, very tough time. And had it not been for the assassination of Benazir Bhutto, it might never have actually done all that well, even in the previous avatar, in the, 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 the election that Asif Zawari uh, won. Now, uh, this uh, Nawaz Sharif is essentially a Punjab mandate. And that is where I see instability, because there's no, he doesn't have any mandate from uh, uh, the frontier, not in Baluchistan, not in Sindh. And already in Karachi, we are seeing trouble with, yeah. with MQM and so forth. So I see lots of trouble, including uh, the fact, it almost takes me to the period when Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto and Mujibur Rahman were jostling yeah. for the mandate. Because one said it's a big oh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss okay. this, this okay. subsequently. Uh, okay. Tapan, uh, the eclipse of PPP and ANP, is it only because of Taliban threats that they were not able to campaign properly, the people were killed? ANP lost about 800 people uh, in, uh, you know, uh, 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 at the hands of the Taliban. Not only during the elections, but, you know, uh, even yeah, before overall. that. Yeah. No, I think it's very clear from the news that we have got that the Tariq Taliban Pakistan had specifically targeted and P and PPP, uh, on, I mean, which actually facilitated uh, Imran Khan's party, hmm? also a PML. Uh, so that's uh, a, a worrying issue because uh, these two parties, which were, as Javed says, that nobody is really secular in Pakistan, but uh, ANP has a history of, you know, it's left leaning and in, in many ways. I mean, it was not a very sectarian party as such. PPP, on the other hand, uh, is in fact the only pan-Pakistan party which had presence everywhere. And if you look at the its support base, uh, it's, it's had a very large support base within the poor and the peasantry and all. So why did they do badly? Is it only because of the Taliban or is it because... No, it's because as, as you and I, you know, we have discussed this many times. I mean, the failure of the government on almost all fronts. Hmm. Okay. People just were tired. Okay. Ah. I mean, it did nothing. And also, I think uh, the Jardari's attempt to create a, uh, to, to, you know, devol uh, give devolution of power to the states, uh, to the provinces, got really nowhere. Hmm. But I think to some extent, he was also hampered. PPP government was largely hampered by Iftikhar Chaudhary. Okay. Okay. That interference. Okay. <laughs> something uh, that. Uh, uh, one quick answer I want to. Sure. So the, the Taliban uh, may not have uh, participated in these elections, but do you think they've managed to shift Pakistan's politics rightwards, which is what Tapan was hinting at, by facilitating uh, Tehreek uh, Insaf Party, PML uh, N, because they're soft on uh, Islamic no, radicals. I, mean, I, I go back to what Javed said. Yeah. And none of them were actually secular in that sense because of the peculiar yeah. uh, situation in Pakistan. After all, even under the PPP government, the massacre of the Shias of the Ahmadiyyas and discrimination was going on. Yeah, yeah. So what kind of secular party allows this? So it's a relative term. Yeah. I think what the Taliban did was to uh, try to create a, an unlevel playing field. But eventually, I think people voted on the basis of performance. And if the PPP was voted out... Although, although Tehreek Insaf had no performance to speak of. Yeah, but there's, there's hope yeah. in somebody yeah. new and fresh. Okay, okay. But there's okay. promise. Okay. So on but that in note, the case sir, of the PPP, the absence in southern Punjab, where they were supposed to do well, and they had done everything possible to win votes there, yeah. didn't materialize. So obviously governance was, was the major much. reason why they failed. Okay. At that point, we need to take a break. Uh, we'll continue this, this, this discussion after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back. We are discussing the fallout of the Pakistan elections and what the results mean for Pakistan, the challenges that Pakistan faces today. Javed, I wanted to ask you, what has been the role of youngsters, uh, youth, in this election? Because they came out in large numbers, especially for Tehreek and Saf party, but people say they also came out for PMLN. So are you seeing the creation of a new political cadre of youngsters coming into politics, people who are cut off from politics earlier but want to change Pakistan and have therefore participated in this election in a big way? Well, um, let me first of all uh, say that this, this is a mythology about youth, because youth uh, in, in the Indian context, I'll give you the example, it can be RSS, can be Maoist, can be uh, Communist, can be Congress, Youth Congress, uh, DMK, uh, Akali, everything is there. Youth means what? Yeah. 
But you're right. Uh, I think generally there is a right-wing tendency in the country, and the youth is gravitating towards that. They're not gravitating to the left, for sure. I wasn't saying uh, that, but this is a very significant point to make. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think when you when you talk about uh, um, Imran Khan, for example, or Nawaz Sharif, Nawaz Sharif's mass base is right-wing. Even if you remember uh, the Bonhomie days of uh, 1999, when um, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the Prime Minister, went to Lahore, there was, you know, he was reciting uh, um, uh, Sardar Jafri's poem in the governor's house, Tumao Gulchane Lahore Se Chaman Bardosh, all the bonhomie was there. But behind everybody's back, and with the knowledge of the establishment in Pakistan, the jamaat e islami were busy cleansing the minar e Pakistan of the footprints of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, because that was a kafir prime minister. How dare he come? Although the jamaat e islami was not part of the movement for Pakistan, and therefore the Minar didn't mean a damn thing to them. Yeah. But um, they were, it, in a populist way, they, yeah. so I think there is a tendency. The youth is gravitating. But the, 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 after all, the hatcheries are there. Um, what has anybody done to invest? Okay. And there's a great Saudi influence and in money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that. Okay. We'll come. Okay. Uh, Tapan, I want to ask you one more thing which not, one noticed about this election was that people used to say that the big political families, the feudal families control Pakistan. But this time, every known dynasty has lost. I was just making a list. The Khars of Muzaffargarh, four candidates, including Hina Rabbani Khar's father, yeah. lost. Jatois of Alipur, three candidates, lost. Gilani is the Multan, five candidates, lost. Chimas of Sargoda, lost. Kairas of Lala Musa, lost. Bharwanas of Jang, two candidates, both women, lost. Rajas of Jhelum, two constituencies, Raja, uh, Raja Afzal, uh, lost. Vattus of Okara, two national assembly seats, two provincial assembly seats, lost. Why has Pakistan voted against dynasties uh, in this manner? Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't read really too much into this that in terms of, uh, you know, there is a revolutionary change in people. No, no, I'm not saying that, but what explains it? No, the, what explains is the failure of the uh, these parties and particularly, I think, uh, also the uh, a fatigue in the people and the coming of the new generation. Uh, with the way uh, the political parties have been managed, the, the manner in which, you know... But how come that fatigue doesn't manifest in India? Uh, well, uh... <laughs> We, I think we are more into dynastic uh, than, than Pakistanis are. I mean, probably the cultural <coughs> difference. We believe it at that. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I, I think there's, uh, I, I don't get the impression that the dynasties have been overthrown. After all, the two r the ruling dynasties are still going to rule Pakistan. Yeah, the Vadiras. The Vadiras will yeah. rule. The Zardaris are still in, in charge of, uh, of yeah. uh, Sindh. Yeah. Yeah. Nawaz Sharif has a dynasty yeah. which is as powerful as anybody else. Yeah. So. Where is the where is the downfall of the dynasty? Well, six or seven of them have lost. You know, two, no, two continue to those, thrive. Those are minor. Okay, all right. But the question uh, I really want to ask you was: minor levels in the feudal <coughs> We will get nowhere on this. <laughs> 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 the question I really wanted to ask you was: that will these elections really solve the uh, problem of imbalance between the centre and the provinces, uh, or will 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 uh, will, the, will these problems increase? Particularly, 18th Amendment, which gives uh, greater financial powers. Uh, control over natural resources to the provinces. And Punjab has always said that this is biased against them because all the gas, etc., is used by Balochistan and Sindh or, you know, or, you know comes to them late. Uh, only they, they get the leftover. Uh, so you have uh, 24 hour power supply in Karachi, but 12 to 14 hour power cuts in uh, Punjab and the industry is dying out. So do you see these problems increasing or decreasing? Well, the flip side of the elections is, is going to lead to a much more polarized Pakistan. And what the political landscape shows you is uh, uh, Nawaz Sharif and his party are confined to Punjab. PPP is confined to Sindh. Yep. Uh, uh, PTI of Imran Khan is confined to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And Baluchistan has just a large coalition of parties. So which means that political polarization is almost complete. And therefore, the friction between the various states is going to increase. And when you have a situation where one province is so dominant, 40% of the population are Punjabis. So Punjab is now Pakistan. And this is something which the other states are going to resent yeah. in the months yeah. to come. Javed, how difficult is it going to be to form a government in Balochistan? Last time in the 65 uh, member assembly, 64 people were in the government. 
and there was an independent who was in the opposition. <laughs> Are we headed towards a similar situation? And what does it do to Balochistan's uh, advantage in terms of 18th Amendment? You know, no. the previous government couldn't control their natural resources. The new government won't be able to control it. And the center will continue controlling it through the army and the frontier corps. Balochistan is quite easily the most sensitive province in Pakistan. The largest geographically, mineral rich, and strategically also it is neighboring uh, Iran. Um, this is where also the bases were perhaps for the drone attacks. And everybody covets and the Chinese are moving in there with the Gwadar port. Uh, so it is, you're right, and that is why perhaps uh, it has been left into this uh, animated suspension because uh, there is no clear cut verdict there. There will be a coalition, a jumble of nationalists and, and ethnic and, and, and communal forces. Um, this, the, the lot of the Hazaras is going to be again uh, up in the air. So I think there is going to be a lot of federal intervention by which it could mean the army. What else can Pakistan do other than sending in troops to control? So so Balochistan I think will continue to be we, as we messy as... One more factor, yeah. the Quetta Shora is based there. It's based yeah. there. So yeah. There's yeah. The yeah. Yeah. there are other aspects also. North of, Quetta, uh, north of Quetta, you have uh, the, the yeah. uh, uh, Islamic extremists, and south of Quetta, you have the Baloch nationalists, yeah. and sure. who but, haven't but, really voted very you much. You see, if you look at the way elections was held, I mean, yeah. it, is, it is only the, uh, the Pustun belt yeah. and Quetta yeah. where the elections actually exactly. were held. Exactly. I mean, people participated. In the, in the Baluch area, you have very little participation and it, is, it shows also to a large extent the failure of the state, the election commission and the security yeah, forces yeah. to provide. So yeah. it's, a, it's, it's not that innocent. Yeah, yeah. And the point is that the, the Baluch nationalists have lost out altogether. Yeah, absolutely. Only 35% voting there, but we yeah. need to take a break at this juncture. Don't go away. We'll continue with this discussion after the break. Welcome back. We are discussing the challenges Pakistan faces after these elections. Ambassador Man Singh, I wanted to ask you about the economic challenges that Pakistan mm -hmm. faces. Mm -hmm. You know, the reserve position is shaky, the rupee is uh, unsteady, and $3.3 .3 billion have to be repaid to IMF between this July and next June. Uh, and uh, bilateral aid is not uh, forthcoming. So how do you think uh, Pakistan is going to handle well, this Well, I think uh, this election has come as a kind of lifeline for Pakistan. A, to have a democratic government which can speak for Pakistan is, is good for Western donors, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, relations with the U.S. have been patched up. Mm -hmm. And between now and 2014, when the troops leave, leave Afghanistan, Pakistan will be important for the Western countries, so they'll be happy to do whatever they can to keep Pakistan financially stable. So if Nawaz Sharif appoints a good, um, eloquent, finance minister acceptable to the West, I think they will get over this. Plus, uh, through the rescheduling or through, uh, through bilateral aid? I, I think rescheduling is what they're looking for, a big handout from the IMF. Mm -hmm. Plus, bilaterally, they're banking on countries like China to bail them out. Mm -hmm. So it's not looking as dismal as, as it was about six months ago. Okay. Javed, I want to ask you, do you think uh, Nawaz Sharif's policy towards U.S. would be any different from that of Zardari's? And to what extent would his policy towards America be influenced by his closeness to Saudi Arabia, you know, who are really uh, the, the sort of cat's paw of America, if you like, in that region? Um, would it be any different? See, Pakistan has always uh, punched beyond its weight in, in strategic terms. Um, and it's succeeded because here you have the entire Afghanistan policy and the withdrawal of troops leaning very heavily on the Pakistani army. I mean, if you remove that from the equation, uh, the Americans will be in a very, very serious fix. Moreover, they're not going to go away entirely. There'll be nine or... Well, or, Taliban also lean, uh, uh, you know, uh, are leaning everybody. on the Pakistan yeah, army and so the, the, the Americans. The, the, so therefore, we have come, completed a circle, it seems, and we are now looking at the good Taliban and really we need to worry mm -hmm. or negotiate those terms. Mm -hmm. What is this thing called good? What is a good fanatic, for mm -hmm. example? Excellent. Are we going to be able to live? And we have maybe in anticipation of all this, we had mended fences with the Saudi Arabia. In the last three or four or five years, we invited their king in fifth, for the first time in 50 years. 
maybe this is some kind of a very shrewd, clever thing, but in which case, what do we do with Iran? Have we left it stranded there or is it, has it lost its vitality for us? I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, a mess that India has to clear, mm. uh, which is also related to Pakistan. Mm. And uh, Pakistan's uh, ties, as uh, Ambassador Man Singh was saying, is very umbilical and it's very crucial. And uh, Saudi Arabia is influencing through Nawaz Sharif because they are really uh, the Siamese twins in, in that area. You know, Nawaz Sharif and Saudi Arabia mean one and the same thing, uh, which means what are we going to see about the Shias and the Hazaras, for example? Uh, because Iran's influence, the Iranian pipeline that was up, uh, that the, the Chinese had, uh, were willing to give some money for, what is going to happen to all that, that becomes a very, very sort of a, okay. you know, sort of a doubtful okay. scenario. Okay. Tapan, uh, how do you see uh, Pakistan's policy towards Afghanistan changing? The same Nawaz Sharif, uh, in the 90s was bolstering the Taliban with the help of the army. Now, will he still continue relying on Taliban to push Pakistan's interests or would he explore some other options? And are there any other options? Now, what are the other options available? Is the I'm question. <laughs> I don't think so. And, and now this search for the good Taliban, mm. which is, I, I don't know, as you said. I mean, I, I always thought it's a an oxymoron. Yeah, I mean, a good fanatic. Who's this good fanatic? Mm. And uh, Talib, I mean, if you, if you look at Nawaz Sharif's uh, main support base and his links, it's always been with the, uh, I wouldn't say directly Islamist, but uh, very, very right-wing uh, forces. So he has, he has a very tight rope to walk, whether he, uh, he, he can't live without the U.S. Also, he cannot live without the Taliban. Mm. So... That's, uh, that's one situation. But I think overall, to come back to this election, I think the election is uh, something which has A, shows us, I mean, the, the enthusiastic participation of the people in the elections, in spite of all the threats, shows a, a change in the, in the, I mean, whether it, it, that led to the... But all elections show of, that. All no. elections show that, but... The, the, no, no, but, but, but look, the, the threats were very serious yeah, in certain yeah. parts, right? And, uh, you know, consider there's the only threats, about a hundred... I want to go to you. The thre right, threats right. are not only, about, not, not only from the Taliban. You know, there are internal threats uh, from Islamic fundamentalists in Pakistan. And Nawaz Sharif's view uh, on internal militancy, these Islamic militants based in Punjab, remains ambiguous. And these are the people who are uh, targeting the Americans also in Afghanistan and targeting, uh, uh, sometimes targeting India. Uh, so, uh, don't you think Nawaz Sharif would have to come clean on his attitude to Islamic fundamentalism, uh, I, I, both I, as an external and an internal threat? I, as we know, Nawaz Sharif is a very pragmatic person. Mm. So, he'll do this tightrope walking. Mm. You don't expect him to be ideologically clean, mm. saying, I'll give up this and give up that. On Afghanistan, let me say this. I've, I've recently come back from Kabul. And uh, I have the feeling that since... Pakistan, Afghanistan relations are now at the rock bottom. It can only improve under Nawaz Sharif. It can't get worse. And I think what Nawaz Sharif will try to do is to some extent to listen to the Americans and say, let's not rock the boat until the transition takes place in Afghanistan. And this whole debate which is going on in Afghanistan about the Durand line and how the Pakistanis are creeping into Afghanistan, all that we think, I, I think will be a sideshow. Uh, they uh, in, in Afghanistan, the Pakistani, and particularly the Pakistani army and the ISI, mm -hmm. have to accept that they cannot claim strategic depth in Afghanistan. The Afghans yeah. don't like it. And so I, I think it is going to lead to a slightly improved relationship, yeah. and perhaps it's better for Afghanistan. Good, very absolute brilliant analysis. Now it leaves a problem for the West. Who is the mascot? Is it Malala Yousafzai? Mm -hmm. Or is it Nawaz Sharif? Yeah. And is bad news for Malala Yusuf Zahi, uh, this Nawaz Sharif's uh, election? Yeah. I mean, this is how I will encapsulate yeah. this whole verdict. Okay, now, you know, we, we want to wrap mm -hmm. up. So, uh, would each one of you sum up what should be India's attitude to, uh, to mm -hmm. Nawaz Sharif and to Pakistan? Should India wait and watch or should it go halfway to meet Nawaz Sharif because he's professed uh, no, I think uh, what India needs to do is, as we are doing with other neighbors, and uh, you know, not 
doing with Pakistan is we should a see that the future of India and Pakistan good relationship depends on the growth of a healthy democratic and therefore, instead of bracketing India-Pakistan relationship only in these hostile terms of Kashmir and security, I think we should extend our uh, support to Pakistan in many sectors, maybe agriculture, maybe irrigation, maybe, I mean, as we are doing with okay, other. Javed, uh, I, think, I think it is, the cards were always with India. Hmm. Whatever it wishes to do, and I think it can negotiate with everybody, and it has done so. It has done, negotiated with the army, it has negotiated <laughs> with the PPP, and uh, it has dealt with Nawaz Sharif. Is there anybody left? But uh, I think the problem is inside India. Yeah. Uh, you have Prime Minister Manmohan Singh signing an agreement with the Prime Minister of Pakistan. And there is somebody sitting here either in the Home Ministry or some deeper security establishment who is too eager by half to tear up that agreement. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, last well, word, I, please. I, I think our approach should be of cautious optimism. I think we need to be positive about the elections. But uh, Nawaz Sharif is on test. I mean, I'm sure that he'll open up uh, business relations with India. That's, that's a low-hanging fruit. But can he deliver on terrorism? That's, that's how we should judge him. Okay. And, and but we are also on test uh, to, to see that, you know, here is a government that is positively inclined, and what are we able to do with them? Well, it's, it's a lame duck government, unfortunately, so we'll have to wait all right. for okay. the elections. Okay. Uh, we've run out of time. I thank all of you for coming to our studios and sharing your views on Pakistan elections and the challenges before Pakistan. We'll see how the situation develops. That's all we have for you today. We'll be back again next week with another interesting issue. Till then, goodbye.